And welcome to Civil Discourse. I'm Jamie Wojciechowski. And I'm Marilyn Brown. And today we are beginning with a quote by Sharon Salzberg. Um, it's actually her quoting Thich Nhat Hanh. Um, and okay. it is, To dwell in the here and now does not mean you never think about the past or responsibly plan for the future. The idea is simply not to allow yourself to get lost in regrets about the past and worries about the future. And I think that's just an important quote, just mm -hmm. in mindfulness in general, because I think there is, we've talked about it so many times, that misunderstanding that meditation and mindfulness is one of two things, either stopping your mind from doing anything, which mm -hmm. is impossible, or it's about just being in the present and trying to never have to deal with the past or the future. Yeah, yeah, that's one of the things that I think um, comes up a lot, and and it's one of those, I, I like the part of the quote where it says dwelling in regrets about the past, because I think that's where we really aren't being mindful. Thinking about the past, there's a mindful way to think about the past, I think is what that, that quote is kind of saying, and there's a mindful way to think about or plan for the future, but oftentimes how we get caught up either thinking about the past or thinking about the future is in a way that's very, very unmindful. And so that's where the regrets come in of things that have already happened. And, and that 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 lack of acceptance, I think, is kind of that the, the piece that really sticks out to me with how we oftentimes approach either dealing with the past or thinking towards the future is kind of this lack of acceptance. And that's that that's what's that's how we miss that mindful piece. So I think that quote is super, super important because it's completely unrealistic to think that we're not going to, um, you know, make plans or, 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 or have ideas or think about things in the future. And there's, you, you have to do that to function um, in this life and to do it in a way. But I think it's important to be aware of how you're thinking about it and that's kind of that mindful piece is how are we how are we engaging with the the how are we engaging with the time when we're not in the present when we're not currently thinking about the present how are we engaging with those other periods of time right right yeah i think yeah. a lot of it too is just uh, the again the lost in regrets or lost in worries about the future and that lost element of it because it very much is the base of pretty much every meditation I've ever done which is if you're just sitting or if you're counting or if you're focusing on something if you get lost in thought once you become aware you come back to the meditation um, and that is really what for me at least meditation has always been it's me trying to count or use a koan or or, or do or just sit and be present um, and then finding myself wander and then being able to bring myself back um, and I think a struggle at the beginning and a struggle throughout um, it just I think shifts a little bit is how long it, it takes for that awareness that you are lost in a different thought mm -hmm. uh, and I think where the danger of being lost in the past in the future come in is that uh, if you don't have any way to bring that into awareness, you are just stuck there. And mm -hmm. it can cause a lot of depression and a lot of different problems um, because we don't have the skill set to be able to bring ourselves out of those states that aren't real. They're not into what is real, which is the present moment. Right, right. And it's like we don't have the skill set and also the, the practice to know what being engaged with the present moment actually feels like. Because if we haven't built up that, that muscle, the, that mindfulness muscle to be able to engage and know what it feels like to be in the present, a lot of times people get so lost and don't even realize, like you said, that, that they're lost. And I think that's a lot of what creates, like you said, depression, anxiety. A lot of what I work with with my clients is, is dealing with anxiety, and a lot of it is getting lost in these these ideas and, and these things, this solid future that we think already exists. 
um, based on our current circumstances and, and, and making decisions now and, and, and avoiding things now or, or um, not approaching things that are presenting themselves in our present now because we're so afraid of this future that we've, that we've already decided exists that we're so lost in these, these stories that we've created. Um, and our mind does such a great job of creating stories. I think that's kind of what it's doing all the time. If we're not intentional and being mindful, our mind is kind of just shooting out stories all the time and creating stories based on our experiences. And so if we're not able to pull back and, and, and anchor ourselves to the present and know what that feels like, then it's very, very easy to just think that that's the reality that we're living in. Yeah. yeah. I think, too, just the ability, I think why there's such a focus on the present and, and mindfulness. Uh, one of the, the many reasons is that it really helps you cope with that sense of loss from the past and the future. Uh, because at least what I find is if I'm really focused on the present, I'm setting myself up for success in the future. So yeah. it's not that I never have to wor plan anything or worry about the future, but I don't have to get lost in it and, and sit in it for a very long time because I'm setting it up for success in the present. Um, and I think, too, that that is true for the past. I think sitting in the past, uh, I can't think of it of a time for myself where I've been able to get over something from the past by dwelling on it. <laughs> it's always once I return to the present and learn something new that then the story that I'm telling myself about the past shifts and then there's less pain or less regret or less whatever kind of the negative emotion associated with that is because I'm learning and moving on through the present. Right. That's so, so important and significant. It's like how you're engaging with the present is actually informing you and teaching you about and allowing you to release things from the past. But if we just sit and try to like focus on it and, and dwell on it, then it's, we never really, we never really get that opportunity to move through it. Right. And I think that's the same thing with the future. I think that, you know, if we engage with the future in a way that is, um, if we're if we're mindful in the present of the things that are leading us towards that future that we that we want or that, you know, the things that we're looking for, the things that we're seeking out, then we're able to kind of build towards that future that we're seeking without even really without having to move too far outside of what's going on right now. And and it's hard because I think a lot of times we look too, too far ahead. And so we're looking five steps ahead when there's something that's presenting itself right now that would really um, seek to be that building block towards the thing that we're looking for in the future. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. 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 I think yeah. it's hard because uh, the, f with the f past and the future don't exist beyond the concepts we have of them. Yes, things in the past have happened, but our view of it is a skewed view based on our own experience and what stuck with our memories. It's not actually uh, a representation of what happened. And I think the problem is that that is not true for the present. The present is what is real whether you're aware and intentional through it or not so we're going through the present every moment um physically and if we're mentally not there then it it, it kind of is a double whammy if you will because if you're pr if you're if you're in the present and you're mindful it helps you kind of navigate the past and the future. But if you're lost in the past or the future, you're also then lost in the present. So it's okay. almost heightens it in a way. It's like a double whammy. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I have a, I have a question for you because I think this is a challenge for, for a lot of us, which I think that is why there's so much depression and anxiety and, and just kind of these states that we struggle with is how do you, or what's been helpful for you to I guess, mindfully engage 
with or like mindfully um, plan ahead without getting too, you know, too either caught up or anxious about the future. Like, how do you, you know, because I feel like the way like you're, you're somebody that you have a lot of things going on in your life and you seem like you have to kind of juggle a lot of different things. And so I can imagine that there's some planning involved and, you know, I don't know, goal setting or something like how do you do that and not get too far ahead of yourself and still stay mindful? Right. Uh, I think uh, for me, I, I think the first part of this is just self-reflecting and realizing where you naturally tend, where your mind naturally tends to go. Because um, mm-hmm. when I started meditating, I realized my mind almost always, when it gets lost, is lost in the future. I almost never really reminisce or th- get lost in the past. Well, it's just not how yeah. I'm wired. I'm a present and future thinking person. Um, mm-hmm. So once I think you are aware of that, uh, it becomes a little easier to navigate because you know you start to realize what to look for. Um, right. And I think, too, there was a big shift when I stopped trying to uh, control the future, right? Mm-hmm. I think a lot of people yeah. set, I have this goal, and then it's a hard, rigid goal that they're just, trying to accomplish and there's no flexibility to it um in the moment so they're just thinking about that goal and missing all these potential opportunities um Mm -hmm. that one could lead them to a different goal or two could lead them to the goal through a different route they haven't thought of before right so what i try to do is plan my life based on what i have to do my career like if i have to go to work i have to go to work i have to put it in my calendar the day I have to go to work Um, but with goals I set the goal as something that exists in the back of my mind um, not something I'm driving towards and that way I can stay present in the moment um, and adapt if things change and I'm also okay with saying okay this is my goal um, but now this has happened in the present so now this goal needs to shift a little bit um and it's kind of ever changing so my perspective on a goal isn't a final destination it's this evolving structure um, right which is right. based on the present and based on kind of what's informing you in that moment yeah which has kind of uh I can see that being a struggle with a lot of people because then you never actually achieve the goal because it's always shifting. You may achieve, you may set it out, I'm going to do this on this day. And by that time you get there, you actually did the original goal. But by the time you got there, the goal has now shifted. So it's like you're always, but it's the idea that the goal is uh, the journey and not the destination. Yeah. That makes sense. No, that makes a lot of sense. That makes a lot of sense. And I think that that's something that I think that you're right, that it is it's a different level of challenging for different people. But I think that a lot of that comes with, um, like you said, that first step of Mm self-awareness that you gain through your meditation and through, you know. Yeah, I think another important thing uh, that works for me is I try to set goals. uh, I I have the power to achieve um, in a present moment. Um, So Mm -hmm. for an example, as an, uh, as an actor, right? I, I don't set goals. Like I want to book this many things this year because that goal has so much to not to do with me. Right. Me being cast is the power of casting directors. Right. So I'll try to set things like, you know, I'm going to produce one project this year or i'm going to um make sure i have footage that displays me in in a certain way so the industry sees me a certain way things i have control over um because then i can start taking actions in the present moment to achieve those things where if i say i want to book i want to book a series regular this year it's Mm -hmm. like okay, well, there's the goal, but there's really nothing underneath it to support it. And if you do find things underneath it to support it, it ends up being those 
day-to-day -day things that you have control over. So I just find it easier to then focus on those things as opposed to that goal you can't achieve by yourself because that's just those thoughts are just going to stop you from being able to execute the things in the present. Right, right. And it's a lot more empowering space to work from of being able to focus on the things that you can actually do and you actually have control over. And like you said, I think those are the things that lead to those other goals and kind of putting yourself out there in that way. But that's, again, that's the part that you can focus on and you're not subject to disappointment around things that you can't, that you have no control over. Right. Yeah. And it helps too with, uh, I think, staying positive because mm -hmm. if you set a goal that you don't have control over, uh, it's this distant thing. And a lot of times you miss the little successes you're having on the way there. Um, yeah. Where if you set things that you're completely in control of, uh, you can have more goals, one, and you see the successes as you go. Um, right. Because they're actual tangible things that you have the power to do. Right, right. And and seeing those successes are, are encouraging for you to keep going and keep moving forward. I think that's one of the things that's super important with any kind of goal setting is being able to actually see your own progress and feel encouraged by what you're doing. And like you said, not putting it on these outside circumstances that, you know, you could put in as much effort as possible but if you set your goal to land a series regular role it doesn't matter what you're doing at the end of the day then you're still looking at that unmet goal and not seeing yeah. all the yeah. things that you did in the in the meantime to get yourself prepared for that to receive that kind when it's when it's time yeah and yeah. i and it's all the other thing yeah. with it is you have to be uh, honest with yourself and adaptable what works for me isn't going to work for everybody i know people mm -hmm. who primarily live in the past and the present um so they really do have to set um a very strong solid goal uh so that they are kind of incentivized to even think and plan for the future because they don't right. um so it's kind of about i think playing with things and seeing what makes you feel mindful mm -hmm. m makes you feel like you have a mindful process if you feel like you're getting uh bogged down thinking about the future thinking about the present doing what you're doing then you have to take the time to analyze what what is it about it and what can potentially be changed and kind of played with to help bring it back mm -hmm. to a mindful place Right, right. Which I mean, I can kind of bring this back to that, which is, you know, usually one of the conclusions that we come to with most of our talks is that really that checking in with yourself, that mindful process, having a, a regular, um, regular mindfulness practice so that you are able to recognize when things aren't working for you, when you are feeling out of alignment and being able to kind of figure out how to pull back and readjust. And I think that's really, you know, you watch people who, um, watching some of the most successful people and kind of how they do things, you'll see that people will, will take, will give themselves opportunity to take that pause and, and really figure out what's going on with them and what direction they want to go in. Um, and I think sometimes that's, that can be really anxiety provoking in and of itself because we live in a culture that's very driven and very hustle driven. And, and so I think we kind of are given this this um, message that like, don't slow down, you'll miss things, you'll miss opportunities, you have to just kind of keep going and keep driving. But I think a lot of times that people will drive themselves in the wrong direction um, and get really far not realizing and not stopping to kind of pay attention to what's going on um, inside and so I think that's super important and can often kind of go against the the norm yeah I yeah. think what's I been think helpful been uh, what was helpful for me when I first started uh, meditating was finding ways to uh, use what you're learning while you're sitting uh, in your real life right it's kind of bringing what happens on the on the cushion into your life is probably the hardest point because mm -hmm. it's easy to sit there and right. when I say easy, it's not easy, but it's, not easy. Uh, <laughs> it's easier to sit there and be mindful and then get up and have no idea how to implement that into your life. 
and I think a lot of people uh, make this mistake, and I made this mistake where uh, I would these important things I would like goal setting, right? Which is important to a lot of people. I was like, I'm going to do this mindfully, right? And then it would be really frustrating because I would fail. And for my career and for things, it's an, it's an important thing for life, right? Um, and once I started saying, you know, I'm going to try to incorporate it mindfulness into today, I'm just going to try to eat mindfully. I'm going to try to cook mindfully. I'm going to try to clean mindfully. These things that don't really, if I don't, if I fail at doing it mindfully, it doesn't really affect my life in, in a huge way. Um, one, I found I was it was much easier to succeed in doing it. Um, and two, then that was allowing mindfulness to kind of seep into the more challenging aspects. So I found I was just naturally starting to approach goal setting and, and thinking about the future um, or reminiscing about the past in a more mindful way naturally um, because I knew what that felt like beyond just sitting and meditating. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I think that, that um, that's kind of one of the more, I won't say it's an overlooked mindfulness tool, but I think that like using mindfulness in kind of everyday activities is really one of the, most effective ways to kind of, um, again, build up that mindfulness muscle and kind of know what that feels like and be able to resonate with that feeling because there's so many things that we do unmindfully all the time. And so when you bring mindfulness into it, you can really kind of feel that shift. And I like what you said, that it doesn't really matter whether you do it mindfully or not. So it takes the, the, it takes any kind of worry or shame or anxiety about how this how what the actual outcome of is it or outcome of it is um and but it it allows you to to connect with that feeling and 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 i think you're right that what what ends up happening is that you find yourself able to be more mindful in in challenging situations or in things that are a little bit more um of consequence without even really realizing it because you've been able to build up that that um you know i don't know i can't think of a better word for it but that you know that feeling and that connection to it um outside of those things and i think that's one of the things that for me has been one of my favorite mindfulness tools i, I like meditation meditation i like sitting on a cushion and i've i've experienced a lot of, of things through that practice but i find that my awareness of just kind of how I navigate the world and how I connect with the world around me um, has really, really grown and has really deepened through practicing mindfulness in just kind of day-to-day -day things like washing the dishes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's interesting. This is a little off topic, but uh, the at least in the, the Zen tradition I, I trained in um, and, and currently still do, um, there's such a emphasis on uh, ritual, um, and that was kind of when I started uh, practicing. That was kind of the weirdest thing for me because, as kind of that rebellious American millennial, uh, the idea of ritual just rubs me the wrong way, um, and it was a struggle for. Uh, it was like a cognitive dissonance for a while because uh, my being wanted to reject it because it was like this ritualistic thing. Um, but I was seeing so much benefit from it. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think it's the, uh, it's interesting because I started to realize it's really the intention, right? A lot of the issues I have with ritual are the fact that uh, people participate without understanding what they are or that they're used to really control people or manipulate certain yeah. situations, right? Where uh, all the rituals in the Zen practice I were doing was really, the, the, the focus of it was to heighten that mindful experience. And yeah. doing them, you can almost immediately see it. Because uh, mm -hmm. I'm a little different. I really hate sitting. I've never liked 
sitting meditation. Mm -hmm. I do it because I see the benefits of it. Yeah. Um, but it has always been uh, relatively painful <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. uh, mentally um, and just not... Yeah, I just wouldn't call it something I enjoy doing. Yeah, um, yeah. The, the aspects of mindfulness I've always enjoyed were the uh, ritual and um, more physical practices. Mm -hmm. uh, I used to do like a, a mindful sword form and, and, and Tai Chi um, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. things mindful like that. that just movement, Things like that, yeah. Yeah, and it, it's just because I always have seen more of a, I think I'm, I, I can see immediately the direct influence on uh, my psyche and my life. And it, it just naturally, I, I see, oh, this happened. I know how to apply this in day-to-day -day life. Um, where I think just sitting, uh, for me, takes a little bit more uh, analysis and work more kind of work. It. Yeah. 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 Huh. That's interesting. And I don't know where that thought was going. It was just kind of a ramble on the ritual because I, I just remembered being so conflicted on, oh, I hate rituals. Rituals are so bad. And then being like, mm. why do I like all of this? And it's so ritualistic. And <laughs> right, right. And it's, it was interesting to me, though, just hearing your feelings about ritual and that you had such a negative, um, you know, negative view of ritual. But like. You know, it makes sense of because of where it was coming from, but I think mm -hmm. um, rituals are actually one of the things that I talk about a lot with my clients of bringing some ritual into their life, some sort of a self-care ritual, some sort of a mindfulness ritual, because I think that is one of the things that um, it, it you really can feel um, the shift in how you're kind of nourishing yourself when you're taking the time to to participate in a ritual that feels feels in alignment with you that you feel connected to and mm -hmm. i think anything can be a ritual um one of the things i've talked about i think we've talked about this before is that for me like with having natural hair i mean i have braids right now this is not my hair but when my natural hair is out that's something that i've had to recognize that i have to incorporate a hair ritual into my week and it has to be something that i I accept and I do mindfully and I, you know, I, I, I have to set aside hours and, and really kind of um, allow myself to recognize that this is a, a self-care ritual for me rather than approaching it from a, oh, i got to wash my hair, it's going to take six hours, I'm so over it, I don't want to do this, you know what I mean? And just realizing like this is part of me loving and appreciating and taking care of myself and 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 then it's funny because when I started to shift it and look at it that way then I enjoy it and it's something that I'm very protective of and it's like oh no it's my you know it's my self-care ritual today sorry I'm busy and it rather than like oh I'm gonna miss out because I have to wash my hair it's just funny how just shifting the way I viewed it has shifted that experience for me and it's not even that something that's that significant right right yeah, yeah. it was it for me, it was really just, I think, the lack of uh, growing up. I w grew up uh, Catholic, but also had a lot of experience in uh, the Mormon church. Um, okay. And I don't want to get into any of my own kind of feelings on either of those. But uh, I think what conditioned me was uh, both those religions are very ritualistic. Mm -hmm. um, and I was expected to participate with ever fully understanding or being mindful of what um i was doing and a lot of times yeah. when i was a kid i would i i wasn't rebellious and like i'm not going to do this i would do it and then afterwards i'd be like okay i don't feel any different or i don't understand mm -hmm. um so then i guess as i just got older there was more and more resentment to it right. because it seemed like uh a manipulation tool versus uh, something that was mindful. And I don't actually think that I, any of those now looking back on it, I don't find any of that to, to necessarily be like manipulative. I don't think all oh, the Catholic church and all any kind of ritual is just manipulative. Um, it was just that for me, it wasn't explained and I didn't have, um, I just didn't understand what I was doing it and how I was, benefiting from it and I didn't feel anything through it right. which was just my own I think a combination of 
it wasn't being explained to me and mm -hmm. how I was reacting to it. Um, and right. cause it's like with, with mindfulness and I say, try sitting meditation. If that, if, if it doesn't work for you right away, like don't just give up because you want to give up, but you can try Tai Chi. You can try yoga. You can try there's calligraphy. Like there's so many things, um, you can try to see if it opens that door. Um, because yeah. I think once you have that experience, then it might be easier to sit because you'll see, oh, this is actually the intention for sitting. Um, right. And once you have that, it it becomes easier because now I can pretty much, I mean, I can do any ritual and add my own intention to it because I know that's what it's going to be. And it may cause controversy because I'm changing the intention to something that uh, is for me um, and may counter what the original intention might have been, but I mean, it, it's at the end of the day, any ritual we do is, is for us. For us. Exactly. So yeah, that's what I was going to say is even if it, it can cause controversy, but that doesn't really, I mean, that's not what rituals are for. You're, you're doing the ritual for you. So make it, make it work for you. Mindful. Yes. Mindful. Right. <laughs> Cause I can also think of a lot of rituals that are just not mindful. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, anything can, you know, anything can be mindful and can, you know, not be, but I think just having that, you know, recognition that I do think that, you know, being able to connect to the meaning of the ritual in and of itself is super important. And I think that's one of the things that, you know, we don't really think about a lot with kids and, and, you know, it, it, and just kind of like how we're, presenting certain things to kids and how we're kind of teaching kids about ritual and things so that they have a, a, an understanding of it and can really make it their own, you know? Right. Yeah. 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 So to, I guess we'll switch to this topic just because I did think it was interesting. Hopefully we don't go down too much of a, a rabbit hole with it. But um, <laughs> uh, I had an interesting experience uh, at the beginning of the month, uh, I was playing, uh, uh, I was acting, um, and my character was homeless. Um, and one day, uh, I had parked maybe like, I don't know, like a half mile away from where we were filming and had to walk to, uh, the car. And I decided I'm just going to go in, in my, uh, the costume I was in, like, I don't care, whatever, I have to get back to set, I just had to get something for my car, and I was on uh, the UCLA campus, um, and it was just very interesting, uh, the uh, looks um, I received and some of the comments uh, I mm -hmm. overheard, um, hmm. and it just really, and I've, I mean, I've seen documentaries where people have done this, where they will dress up to kind of get the experience, um, yeah. and... I don't even know if I have a mindful takeaway beyond just it made me real realize how much we truly judge one another solely based on appearance. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And it was just it was just I mean, it didn't it didn't bother me or anything. I just found it very kind of interesting, um, specifically being a very kind of clean cut uh, young white man in America. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm to see how vastly different uh, yeah. the world perceived me so quickly. Um, right. I mean, I had a, I had like a huge tattoo on my arm. Um, I had uh, a, a nose piercing right through the middle. Like my hair was just totally different. I was like dirtied up. Um, yeah. So it was quite a, a drastic change. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. What do, you, what do you, I mean... Like with that experience, what did what was kind of the biggest? I guess, like, what did you notice the most when you recognized that that was happening? Um, it was interesting because I think just the first place I went uh, was not really about anyone, the way they were looking at me or the judgments I was getting, but more how I do this. Like if I, I completely like I would be one of those if I had if I saw me walking down the street I would be one of those people, um, yeah. not necessarily I would never say anything or anything but you right. know if I see a homeless person and I can avoid them and like 
go to the next street. I'm not going to, I will do that. I will, mm-hmm. you know, I don't, um, and I don't necessarily think, I don't even want to say bad or good because right. um, yes. a lot of times it's a safety thing of just, you know, I've been in situations where, um, especially in LA, a lot of the homeless are mentally ill and um, situations escalate very mm-hmm. quickly. I mean, I've seen people get pushed and punched for mm-hmm. just saying like, I, I'm sorry, I don't have any money. Um, so mm-hmm. I think it's it's a hard thing to balance. Um, I think the hard right. thing about it was also I had the, uh, the um, mindset of who the character was. Um, and the character was not... Uh, mentally ill the character was quite young and was kicked out of his home and came to LA and had to uh was basically homeless with no family with no nothing um Mm -hmm. and basically turned to sex work to survive um Mm -hmm. and and story for homeless youth yeah and And he's finding out yeah yeah he's finding out he's HIV positive and he's looking for his bro it's like this whole thing um so just having that also in the back of my mind and getting the the looks that are clearly um no intention to to care or give the benefit of the doubt um right. yeah it was just yeah interesting because that's also something i i tend not to do um i'll like notice and and avoid if i can and stuff like that but I don't, I always think of, well, I don't know this person's story, so I'm not going to make judgments beyond um, this could be a risky situation that I want to avoid. Um, Mm -hmm. But I think a lot of people don't do that. They just, there's, uh, I mean, there's just a huge uh, view in our society that homeless people are less than and, and often deserving or lazy. And that's why they're in the situation they're in. And, um, it's just, I mean, if you do anything, I've worked in shelters and and stuff like that. And you just see, it's just not the reality of it. Um, so. Yeah. So it was one of like getting that that awareness from a different perspective because like you said you're you're aware of that that everybody has different individual stories as to how they ended up in that situation but for you to feel that yourself you know and be in this mm-hmm. characters you know to be in this to be to be in character and to be feeling that like um judgment and kind of rejection from you know from the people that you're encountering i think that that is something that like we don't um we can have an awareness of it, but it's different to know what that feels like um, and to think about what that feels like and to actually bring that into your awareness on a regular basis. I think that you're right a lot of the times, um, you know, and I've worked off and on with homeless populations my whole career, and so it's something that I've, I've never really... Um, you know, it, it's it's an area that I've worked in, but like you said, it, it is there is a safety um, issue, and so oftentimes we're just kind of engaging quickly in the like, okay, let me just like you know, not be rude to this person, but also like make sure that I'm okay. Um, and I don't think we stop to think like anything else about what their experience might be like in that moment. Yeah. And, yeah I, 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 go ahead. Uh, I, I think the other part that was interesting, and I don't, I mean, I don't know what anyone who was around me was actually thinking, but uh, there are uh, quite a few homeless people around UCLA, and most of the time I feel like they're walking around and no one really pays them any notice. Um, I think potentially what caused so many people to be visibly, like, looking at me and, and kind of curious I think was because one, you don't see many young homeless people in that area. And two, I came out of a campus building. Mm -hmm. So I think, and that's when I got most of the looks is when I came out of a classroom. So I think Mm -hmm. there was probably a lot of people trying to figure out, is this a student? Like what's kind of what's going on? Um, That makes sense. But the fact that that occurs based on just, 
how people look. Um, and I mean, we in America, it's you get it from homeless. You get it based on race. You get it based on age. You get it based on uh, sexuality, on sex, on like everything that potentially you can see physically um, or assume physically about someone. Uh, mm -hmm you're going to get judged for at some point because um, it's just very much how our culture functions at the moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sounds like that was an interesting experience. Yeah. It doesn't feel... sound like you said, like it, it's not like one of those where it was an intentional experiment where you were like, okay, I'm going to like dress up and walk around campus and like see what happens. This was like, I'm, I've got to be on set and so I'm just dressed and I'm just going to go, right? It wasn't something yeah. that you planned. So that's, I feel like that's even more interesting because it wasn't like you weren't looking for any kind of reaction. You were just, you know. Right. Yeah. yeah. And that's basically yeah. it. Just, I just was surprised by it. And then my mind started kind of wandering through uh, it. And I wonder too, if it was because it was a new experience, I wonder how much, uh, people realize themselves being judged based on physical appearance in a day-to-day -day, uh, situation, unless it's, you know, a, an someone's actually saying something or, or stopping or something out of the ordinary. Clearly, like, that's happened. You're like, why, why are you staring at me? Um, right. But, yeah, it was just, it was interesting. It was also, I mean, interesting being in a safe environment i was at ucla i it was a very short trek to my car and back i knew like mm -hmm. i my i got a lot of looks coming out and a lot of looks getting into my car so mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> yeah i feel like i i want to have some like really insightful experience from it but it was really just more i think of an interesting thing and then later in that day it, it was uh, interesting too because i was coming back from uh some stunt training i was doing and stopped at the gas station and a homeless man approached me um with his dog and uh told me his whole life story um <laughs> but because that happened i was i'm normally pretty good i always don't most of the time i don't carry cash so there's not much money i can give them um but right. if i'm not in a hurry and stuff and they're like chatty i'll chat and be nice and, and that but yeah. uh, that was probably a good 20 minute conversation that really only happened because I had that experience before and was kind of in and I, I gauged pretty yeah. yeah I gauged I was at I was in a gas station like there were people around and he was carrying a dog so I'm a very very tiny tiny cute dog that I was like well you're not gonna you're not you can't really threaten me while you're holding a dog unless you're gonna put right. the dog down um, so, yeah, and I mean, I don't know, I mean, I got, it was an interesting story that he told me about his life, I don't, you never know if it's true or not, but, I mean, it was just, it, the experience definitely made me, uh, more open, um, and conscious, yeah. uh, to not be doing, to try not to do that, um, mm -hmm. right. Yeah, yeah. Huh. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like I want to end with something positive, but uh, do we have homework? Maybe homework can be positive. Um, let's see. Gosh, I don't know what maybe we should do with homework. I guess I want people to just check in about their their mindfulness practice. Have they yeah. been practicing mindfulness? And if they are practicing, are they doing sitting meditation? Are they doing mindful, like some kind of mindful movement or some kind of other type of mindful activity? I'm just really curious about like what you guys are, what you guys are doing right now to kind of keep um, up that, that, that mindfulness skill. So, yeah, I'm also <laughs> really interested in what people do, uh, what rituals or, or practices they do mm -hmm. to help stay mindful while they're navigating the future and setting goals um, and how they uh, just set uh, if, if you set goals or if you set uh, Intention. patterns or yeah daily activities or whatever you do how you maintain mindfulness through it awesome okay we will see you next time
Great. See you guys next time.